Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. In the heart of the San Fernando Valley, a city was born, Van Nuys, California, founded in 1911 and named after the wealthy businessman, Sir Isaac Van Nuys. On a sunny afternoon of February 22, 1911, Mr. Van Nuys made an offer that was too good to refuse, a free train ride to the new town. By the end of the day, all of the lots up for sale were sold. Once a tranquil, affluent farming town, Van Nuys transformed into a bustling city of commerce after the end of World War II in 1945. Soldiers returning home found solace in the welcoming arms of the San Fernando Valley, making it their new home. The city's charm was immortalized in Bing Crosby's hit song, I'll Make the San Fernando Valley My Home. Van Nuys has been home to many famous personalities, including Robert Redford, Jane Russell, Bob Waterfield, Don Drisdale, and even the iconic Marilyn Monroe. But among these luminaries, there was one individual whose life took a drastically different path. On January 24, 1949, a child was born, who would grow up to be known not for her fame or talent, but for a far more sinister reason. Little did her parents know that their precious daughter would one day become a death row inmate. Born in Van Nuys, California, just 48 years after its founding, was Carrie Lynn Dalton. This is her story. May 23rd of 1995, I sat in a frigid courtroom listening to a scripted dissertation slide easily from the Honorable Judge Thomas J. Whalen's lips. I hope your witnesses were sincere and that you have found God. I hope that he forgives you. The meticulously groomed silver-haired man in a perfectly creased shimmering black robe peered over the top of his glasses and turned his head just an inch to his left as he spoke directly at the defendant. His melodramatic words followed the pronouncement that he was upholding the sentence to kill my sister. Carrie's childhood was far from perfect. Her father was an alcoholic, and he left his wife and children when Carrie was young. Having an absent father left a void that would cast a shadow over her life. The absence of a stable father figure and the struggles of her early life led Carrie down a dark path of drug abuse, a battle she would fight for many years. Despite her tumultuous upbringing, though, Carrie was able to find love, and she started her own family. She and her husband got married and the two had five children together. Like her father, Carrie's husband left the family, but not because he wanted to. He was up to no good and got locked up, leaving Carrie to fend for herself. Carrie was still using drugs when her husband was locked up, so finding a place of her own was difficult. She ended up rooming with someone she befriended, a 23-year-old by the name of Irene Melanie May. Irene was also a drug user hooked on meth. Carrie's family and Irene lived together in a mobile home park community, but on June 25, 1988, Irene found it difficult to manage her money and pay her bills instead of paying for drugs, so she got evicted from her home. Just like Carrie's husband, Irene's husband, Bobby May, was also locked up. With both women depending on drugs to live, they now had no place to live, and they enlisted the help of other drug users to help them move their things out of their home. Cheryl Baker, an ex-con and meth user, had once been busted for Grand Theft Auto. Cheryl, Mark Lee Thompson, and a man named George agreed to help Carrie and Irene with the move. The group had only known each other for a couple of months, but they clicked. Carrie, even though she had a husband in prison, was infatuated with Mark, and their drug-using lifestyle was compatible, so they became girlfriend and boyfriend. On the evening of January 25th, Carrie and Mark struck out for a night on the town. Little did they know that the early hours of the following morning would bring them to a fateful encounter with their friends Cheryl, George, and Irene at a local convenience store. In spite of feeling high and excited, the group decided to take an even more dangerous risk by heading to Joanne Fedor's mobile home in Live Oak Spring, California at 2.30 the following morning. The mood swiftly changed upon arrival when Carrie was spotted rummaging through her purse with suspicion that some of Irene's jewelry had been left behind. Tensions began to mount as Carrie accused Irene of theft while Irene hurled accusations back in return. 
Fueled by drugs and paranoia, the women grew louder, and soon enough, concerned neighbors were calling the police on them. When a sheriff's deputy arrived at Joanne Fedor's home to respond to a burglary call, he reported no evidence of criminal activity other than Joanne's being high on meth, and apart from Joanne, there were no occupants present at the time. Despite not finding any physical traces or bloodshed, the report mentioned that Joanne was a 5150, indicating her mental incapacity to comprehend reality due to her drug-induced state. With caution, Mark, George, Cheryl, and Carrie left Joanne's home. However, Irene would never be seen or heard from again. For four years, Mark, Cheryl, and Carrie were literally living the high life. Over the years, the three of them lost touch of George. Only a few knew about what had happened to Irene, but those who did were too scared to inform the curious people about where she was. Police were notified by Irene's family that she had gone missing, but because she never stayed in one place for very long and had no fixed address, it was difficult for them to conduct an investigation. One day, Carrie, Cheryl, and Mark were talking with their friend Donald McNeely. It was then that Mark revealed what they had done to Irene in order to make her pay for stealing items from Carrie. She had been subjected to electric shocks, her knees smashed with a skillet, and attacked with various sharp tools and objects. The cruel plan was finished off by injecting her with battery fluid. After the murder, Irene's body was dismembered and buried on two Indian reservations, and this was carefully planned so the police would have a difficult time obtaining search warrants. The trio could not keep the secret to themselves, and they showed no remorse when recounting the story to Donald McNeely or anyone else they told. However, Donald was deeply disturbed by everything he heard and became determined to seek justice for Irene's murder. Finally, in 1992, the authorities were alerted to their crime after several witnesses came forward and recounted the chilling accounts of the trio's bragging. The three were arrested and taken to court for a preliminary hearing to determine if they needed to stand trial for Irene Melanie May's murder. Carrie had just been sent to jail, and the first thing she did was call her sister, Victoria Ann Thorpe. Vicky, they arrested me for something, something terrible, Carrie said, her voice trembling. It's going to be in the news, but don't believe it, none of it. She continued desperately, explaining that she hadn't done anything wrong. Although Victoria believed her younger sister was telling the truth, she couldn't help but think back to her childhood and how their family had looked down upon women and saw them as worthless. The women in my family are worthless, absolutely worthless. She wasn't referring to Carrie, but the women who were given the responsibility of looking after them and teaching them right from wrong. In November 1992, Mark, Cheryl, and Carrie were charged with conspiracy to commit murder, murder, intentional killing while lying in wait, and intentional killing involving extreme punishment by the San Diego District Attorney. The three of them were set to stand trial together, but in July of 1993, things changed. Their trial was severed, and each person was now going to stand trial alone. Cheryl pled guilty to second-degree murder, and Mark pled guilty to first-degree murder. The details of Carrie's plea weren't specified in the court documents, but she faced charges of conspiracy to commit murder and first-degree murder. When Carrie's trial began in 1995, her friend Cheryl turned against her and testified as a prosecution witness. Her boyfriend Mark chose to stay by Carrie's side and refused to testify against her. However, his pillow talk with cellmates became his downfall and they informed the prosecution about what he had said to them in confidence. This evidence was used against Carrie during trial. Defense tried to argue that Carrie had a horrible upbringing and should not be judged harshly. They said that Carrie had five children and her children needed her. She had also turned to religion in prison and turned her life around. The prosecution brought up the fact that Carrie was a previously convicted felon and was used to drugs and crime. The prosecution did a good job painting Carrie as a cold-hearted killer because it did not matter to the jury that Irene's body was never found. They found Carrie guilty of all charges. According to court documents, the judge instructed the jury in accordance with California law. If the jury decided to sentence Carrie to death, they were not required to find beyond a reasonable doubt that one, an aggravating factor existed, two, the aggravating circumstances outweighed the mitigating circumstances, and three, the aggravating circumstances were so substantial that they warranted death instead of life without parole. On May 23, 1995, the jury returned with a verdict of death. 
Over the years, there were many appeals. In one appeal, Kerry said, the death penalty statute does not lack safeguards to avoid arbitrary sentencing. All of Kerry's appeals were being denied, but finally, in 2019, Kerry, her family, and her supporters were hopeful. Kerry appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, and the appeal questioned whether California's death penalty scheme violated the requirement under the Fifth, Sixth, and Fourteenth Amendments that every fact other than a prior conviction that serves to increase the statutory maximum for the crime must be found by a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. On May 16, 2019, the Supreme Court of California published their opinion on Kerry's automatic appeal. The justices found the charge of lying in wait and the charge of conspiracy were invalid. Therefore, they recommended that her sentence be revised to 25 years to life. Despite the Supreme Court of California's recommendation to revise her sentence to 25 years to life in 2019, the third death qualified charge against Carrie was not invalidated, so she continues to wait on death row. To date, Carrie is being held at the California Women's Death Row facility in Chowchilla, California. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Let me know what you guys think of the story in the